What do you think of Eminem? Is that is it? What do you think of white rap? Well, you know, I don't, I don't it's, see one thing about something. The ghetto is, is, is colorblind on a sense. If you really from the ghetto no. and you really doing those things you rapping about and you talking about, I can respect that. Right. But if somebody else writing your rhymes, uh, somebody else is you telling somebody else's story. Eminem doesn't write his own lyrics. Come on, man. Come on, dog. Now you must know that those are not my words. It's all Suge was saying in that clip. And it's nothing short of ridiculous, I know. But you gotta understand where those statements were coming from when Suge did this interview with Howard Stern in the late 90s. Death Row was practically overhead first on a steep descent to bankruptcy. Suge had a hollow roster and a nasty reputation that made everyone avoid him like a plague. And even worse, he only had himself to blame. So when he looked over the fence and saw his neighbors winning, he resorted to the only only tactic he knew, the very tactic that had taken him to the very top in the industry. They was not scared of Suge Knight. They was terrified of Suge Knight. Right. I mean, terrified. I know. No. To death. To death. Intimidation. But you see, Eminem was no regular white boy. Homie was from Detroit. And if you know his story, you know he had gone through the bender. Everyone might have been terrified of the death row boss, but Eminem admits that he was never scared of Suge Knight. But how true is this really? Well, let's find out. Not the first white boy. When you first hear Eminem over your instrumental for that, for that particular record, what does that feel like? Man, it, it's amazing. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's always refreshing to know that the artist that you're working with is going to enhance your track. I don't think I need to tell you how much Dr. Dre respects Eminem. Beyond respect, they love each other, and every moment they have the chance to show up for themselves, it is 100. And that's interesting because there's no way we can cover the beef between M and Suge without touching Dre. But before we move ahead, we got to figure out what this story is really about. Are we talking about M's fearlessness in the face of the sugar bear, or are we talking about the terrifying nature of the sugar bear himself? Because if it is the latter, then you must know that Eminem wasn't the only first white boy Suge would try to ram the fear of the devil into. And unlike M, he succeeded. The time I met Suge Knight was at a restaurant in LA called Palm, Palm Restaurant. And uh, I was sitting there eating, nice meal. And all of a sudden these huge guys who looked like a football team showed up. You know, it was very intimidating to see these guys that were bigger than my bodyguard, you know, and a bunch of them. And they pretty much grabbed my bodyguard and pulled him out and sat down next to me right there. And Love him or hate him, Vanilla Ice was crucial to the mainstream success of hip hop as a genre. His single Ice Ice Baby was the first hip hop single to top the Billboard charts and has been credited with helping to diversify hip hop by introducing it to a mainstream audience. Around the time Vanilla Ice was peaking, Suge Knight was a fixer. He had tried his hands on the NFL because he fitted the profile like a glove, but his coach didn't think he had the talent, so he was benched. Never the one to watch from the sidelines while the game was on, Suge Knight opted out, and despite his family's plea to return to football, Suge took to the streets. From concert, promoter to bodyguard, to music publishing to fixer, Suge was quickly becoming a main character in the industry. Soon enough, he had garnered a reputation for fixing problems for artists. And this is what brought Vanilla Ice had the unfortunate opportunity to come into close quarters with Suge. Now there's two accounts to how this whole shit went down. Vanilla Ice account and Suge's account of things. I'll start with Suge's. Fact is, his beef with Vanilla Ice started from necessity, from before he even got into music publishing. In his own words, when I was on the road, I seen everybody getting fucked. I'd have guys come up to me like, man, I have this hit song. And they give the demo to the artist or manager and all of a sudden somebody else is singing the song and they're not getting credit. Or they sold it to them for $1,000 and it was worth half a million. This was actually what led Suge into starting a publishing company. And almost immediately he struck gold because guess what? One of the earliest songs he helped publish was Ice Ice Baby. You got that right. Suge says he danced watching Vanilla Ice do his thing on TV because the white boy was his success because in his words he paid for the dude to go out there and write the song the dude in question was mario johnson and when johnson called vanilla ice's team for the royalties they practically told him to f off now if you know anything about suge i don't need to tell you why this was a terrible error on their part but credit where credit's due they didn't know either at the time suge was still in the supporting cast maybe even c-list he wasn't the main character so it was time to introduce himself officially but wait before i break down the infamous encounter between vanilla ice and suge let me give the white boy a chance to defend himself because he says that this was not how things happened. Who is Mario Laval Johnson? His name is listed. That's the guy that Suge Knight brought over there that is an acquaintance, acquaintance of mine that had nothing to do with that song. 
Vanilla Ice claimed neither Suge nor his writers had anything to do with his hit 1990 single. He told the reporter that the first time he ever came into contact with Knight was when Knight and his crew approached him at an upscale restaurant. Months later, Ice claimed they did the same thing, making him confused about how Knight knew of his whereabouts. But Knight claimed he and Ice were always friendly. What Vanilla Ice didn't know was that all of those visits were dessert before dinner, because when Suge would come around. To deliver the message he'd been teasing, it was like something out of a Scorchesi Mafia movie. In 1989, Vanilla Ice and his bodyguards and entourage were at the Beverly Hills Hotel when Suge arrived with six other men. They beat up his bodyguards and roughed up his entourage. Then, Suge took a minute with Vanilla Ice himself. Suge took me out on the balcony, started talking to me personally. On the balcony? On the balcony, high above, like 15 floors. He had me look over the edge, show me how high I was up there. You scared? I needed to wear a diaper on that day. <laughs> right there and then, Vanilla Ice was forced to sign away points of the song to Johnson, about $4 million. It was this money that Suge used to fund Death Row. This was what made Suge the main character of the early to mid 90s hip hop, how he came to dominate East Coast hip hop. But that's not what this story is about. It's a story of how Suge became the definitive boogeyman of a genre dominated by street guys. A lot of Suge's fearsome reputation came from the fact that he was backed by his gang affiliation with the mob Peru Bloods. It's difficult to say that Suge was a blood enforcer because he didn't really follow the rules. Sure, he financed them, housed them, and was probably the reason why the Bloods rose from a back alley street gang to a major force in gang culture, but the man also rolled around with Crips. In fact, he put food in the mouth of Crips. Don't believe me? Okay. What flag does Snoop rep? There's your answer. The fact is that Suge surrounded himself with gang members because he knew he had to be untouchable to be a real threat, and the things he couldn't do himself, the Bloods did for him. Beyond that, he even recruited Pac into the fold. But what about the police, you say? Didn't Suge fear that in his rampage through the industry ladder to the very top, he would get in trouble with 12? Good question. Because you must know that Suge was not really a criminal with a code. He was an equal opportunity abuser. One time, he beat his girlfriend unconscious. Then he stripped her naked in the middle of the streets and walked away. This particular incident gave him a lot of heat from 12. But Suge found his way out of this because he had LA cops in his pocket. Not all of them, of course. But enough to insulate him. I'll paint an event that best illustrates this for you. Fast forward to 1992, Death Row Records is hot, very hot. And at this time, Dre is with Suge. Now, Dre had asked a pair of aspiring rappers, Linwood and George Stanley, to come in for a recording session. Unfortunately for these two rappers, the day they chose to visit was the same day Suge decided to stop by the same studio. Now pay attention because all of this rambling is more connected to Eminem than it looks. It'll all make sense in a minute. Okay, so these noobs stop by the studio. They begin recording with Dre when, sometime mid-session, one of the rappers, Linwood, decides to make a call and picks up the first phone he finds. Now, he did not know it at the time, but the phone he picked was reserved for calls from drug kingpin Harry O, who just happened to be one of the major financiers of Death Row. Harry O was in prison at the time and had limited telephone access. And guess what? He too was given the vanilla treatment from Suge. Not as dramatic, but Suge f***ed him over. But hey, that's a story for another day because back in the studio, Suge spots the trespass and he respectfully tells the young man to drop the phone saying, Blood, don't be on that phone. But this rapper was naive and instead of just heeding the sugar bear's warning, he responded rudely saying, don't be coming at me with all that gangbang shit. I'm not from LA. What happened next? Well, Suge pulled out his gun on both rappers, made them strip down to their underwear and beat them both to a bloody pulp. After this VIP treatment, Suge warned them not to go to the police. They did. But if they was thinking they was going to get justice, they had learned nothing from the beating because Suge found a way to bury the case. How, you ask? He got the prosecuting attorney's daughter, Gina Longo, a record deal. I mean, you can't make that it up. Suge must have been studying mafia bosses because what the fuck? But you see, while Suge was good at winning battles, he was terrible at winning wars. He might have used terror to take on the industry, but it was that same terror that destroyed his record label. In March 1996, Dr. Dre left the label amidst the contract dispute and growing concerns that label boss Suge Knight was corrupt, financially dishonest, and out of control. Too violent for Dr. Dre. So if you shoot somebody, you go to jail forever. To the kids, you don't want to go to jail forever, right? Right. So they got this new thing out that people sell them all the time. They got this stuff to call, they get blood from somebody with AIDS, yeah. and then they shoot you with it. Oh, so well, that's that seems happen, bad. That's yeah. a slow death. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> easy thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs>
before Suge and Dr. Dre became sworn enemies, Suge was his literal guardian angel. It's a long story with a lot of NWA lore, but if we are going to really map out the M vs. Suge beef properly, we must die into it head first. Back to 1991. Back to Easy e his NWA, and their manager, Jerry Heller. These are the characters you need to know because this was the final lap of NWA. Ice Cube was already long gone. Dre was trying to leave, but Easy e wouldn't let him. A dilemma that needed fixing. And can you guess who Dr. Dre turned to when it became clear Easy e wouldn't let up? The Sugar Bear. So what happened next, you ask? See, I really wish I was making this shit up, but I'm not because what happened next, once again, played out like something from a Scorsese-helmed gangster flip. Suge paid Easy e a visit on his own turf. Bear in mind, Easy e was no pushover. The man might have been all of five feet two inches, but he was a former Crip drug dealer with real street cred and his own reputation. Easy e was not the kind of guy you would mess with, and yet Suge Knight messed with him. Suge arrived at the Ruthless Records office with his negotiators, which was basically a bunch of guys that were brandishing lead pipes and baseball bats. Their intent was clear, and Easy e could differentiate between a bluff and serious business. Suge meant serious business, and he wasn't leaving until he had made a deal. He knew that he had just two choices. He could either sign the papers that let Dre go, or he would suffer a ridiculously gruesome beatdown. Easy e chose life and allowed Dre to move on with Suge. But when the dust had settled, the ruthless record boss wanted his pound of flesh. He wanted to take out Suge, but his manager, Heller, advised against it. In fact, Heller would have his own encounter with Suge soon after. And although this one is an irrelevant side story, it is wild and Imitel it all the same. Word was that after he heard of the incident with Easy e Jerry Heller felt so intimidated by Suge's visit that he hired a pair of weightlifters called Animal and Michael to act as his bodyguards. When Suge arrived at Heller's office, met the bodyguard and didn't meet, he forced the weightlifting bodyguards to crawl around on all fours pretending to be dogs. I told you it was wild. The Sugar Bear was disrespectful on a litany of levels, but I guess he didn't expect that Dre would turn on him for keeping up with the same energy that he had used to bring him out of NWA in the first place. Because you should know that after Easy e they went on to have immense success. I don't even need to say this. We know the numbers that The Chronic did. In 1992, Dr. Dre released his debut solo album, The Chronic. It was a game changer, a masterpiece that blended funky beats, smooth melodies, and hard-hitting lyrics. The album became an instant classic, solidifying Dre's status as one of the greatest hip-hop producers of all time. The Chronic reached number three on the Billboard 200 and has been certified triple platinum with sales of three million copies in the United States, making Dre one of the top 10 best-selling American performing artists of 1993. The Chronic spent eight months in the Billboard Top 10. The album's three singles became top 10 Billboard singles. It was an iconic collab, legendary to say the least. So you cannot blame Dre if he felt that Suge would slow down with the gangster CEO lifestyle he was running on, especially with all of the success and all of the violence that got them there paying off in paper. Turns out Dre's feelings were wrong, because you see the difference between Suge and every other bully out there is the fact that Suge was truly and genuinely a violent man. He wasn't some emotionally unstable bozo who swung between moods like some lioness in heat. Suge was stable. His rest state was psycho. And all of this is interesting when you consider that Dr. Dre himself was not necessarily a peaceful man himself. In fact, like Suge, there have been confirmed high-profile cases of him beating up women that he felt crossed the line. After Ice Cube left NWA in December of 1989, he went on a disroll call on the whole NWA crew. Ice Cube won't pump it up. I got all suckers 100 miles in run. I'd like to give a shout out to the DLC. Through this time, legendary pundit D. Barnes gave both Cube and the NWA airtime on the Fox show Pump It Up. Shit went sideways when the producers decided to place an NWA interview and an Ice Cube interview in the same segment. Dre interpreted it as disrespect, and when he met Barnes at a release party in Hollywood, all hell was let loose. According to Barnes, he picked her up by her hair and began slamming her head and the right side of her body repeatedly against a brick wall near the stairway as his bodyguard held off the crowd with a gun. After Dr. Dre tried to throw her down the stairs, and failed, he began kicking her in the ribs and hands. She escaped and ran into the women's restroom. Dr. Dre followed her and grabbed her from behind by the hair again and proceeded to punch her in the back of the head. Finally, Dre and his bodyguard ran from the building. What did she do that would that, What did she do? What did she do that created the situation and made it that bad? Try to make us look stupid. <sighs> Try to play us. Is that national TV? Try to play us. On national TV. Try to play us in front of millions of people. It's not over yet.
In case you don't know, that's MC Ren of NWA defending and doubling down for Dre in the immediate aftermath of the incident, and Easy e right beside him trying to encourage him to shut the fuck up. However, Dre grew out of his violent past, and if he was ever abusive, it was low profile enough to not make the news. Like we already pointed out, Shu was the exact opposite. The more money and status he got, the more he weaponized it. So when Dre felt Suge had become too violent even for him, the legendary producer decided to walk out through the front door. M versus Suge. There was cassette tapes everywhere. And I remember him picking up this cassette tape. He pops this in. And I was like, what the f and who the f is that? Rewind that. Play that again. Dre was free from Suge, but not without losses. The Sugar Bear was sitting on the rights to all the work he had done under Death Row, and he refused to budge. So, Dre moved on. Wasn't worth the hassle. Now, he had to rebuild. And he found all the help he wanted in a man named Jimmy Iovine, who was the president of Interscope at the time. With Dre's newfound label, Aftermath, he needed a new artist. And that is how Jimmy got him onto Eminem. Truth was, before Jimmy, Dre had actually encountered Eminem's music because in 1997, Eminem appeared appeared on the syndicated radio program, The Wake Up Show, where he did some freestyling, which Dre heard and remembered. But Dre wasn't motivated to do anything until Iovine gave him a tape of the Slim Shady EP. Dre would later say, when I heard it, I didn't even know he was white. Dre wanted to meet this unknown talent right away. So Eminem's manager scraped together some money to fly him out to Los Angeles. When he met Dre, a nervous Eminem couldn't even look him in the eye, which made Dre think that M didn't like his music. But Amin would later say that he was just in awe and shock because he had been a fan of Dre since he was little. Since NWA, in his own words, I was like, dog, your motherfucking Dr. Dre. The soon-to-be legendary duo quickly went into the studio where they quickly put together four songs in six hours including Role Model and My Name Is. The success that followed was almost biblical. Eminem wasn't just a good rapper or some gimmicky industry plant like Vanilla Ice. He was talented, the real deal. He was a great rapper in a genre dominated by blacks. And that would quickly become a problem, especially for Suge, who was experiencing a decline in his entire enterprise. And it is with this that we get back to the very beginning, to the Howard Stern interview with Suge. M was now the prodigy of Dr. Dre. Dre left death row. Shug didn't like that. Dre getting back on. Got this this white rapper that's ended up being the best rapper in the fucking world. Shug had a problem with it. He was like, you know what? That kid need to be with us over at Death Row. It was back to the vanilla ice treatment with Suge, the only tactic he knew to use without actual violence, intimidation. So at the 1999 Source Awards, Suge sent a message that was too clear to be ignored. M had performed with D12 at the show, and normally his bodyguard could have been with him, but the rules was no bodyguard was allowed, leaving M exposed to whatever. M was walking to his seat, I'm standing up to the side, and M was cut off on his way to his seat, and all these guys in red shirts surrounded him. And I'm looking at M's face and I'm looking at these guys. I'm like, something ain't right. M's bodyguard might have stepped in just in time, but they still had a message to deliver. And soon enough, in full view of everyone, they began calling out Death Row over and over again. When M's bodyguard asked them what that had to do with M, one of them responded that it was a message from Suge himself. It was then the bodyguard understood. M's inherited beef had become real. And now Suge was willing to force M away from Dre into his failing label. This was just a threat. The next time Suge was going to come for M, it was like, can you guess, something out of a Scorsese gangster flick. But this time, it was international. No Nobody said when we got in that van, nobody said shit. all you could hear was the locking and loading of 40 cows, Desert Eagles, the Velcro, a bulletproof vest put in them. So all you heard was click, clack, snip, snap, shh, shh. Clap, click, clack, clack. Fast forward to 2001. Death Row is in shambles. The Sugar Bear is more desperate and Eminem is on top of the world. More successful than he was in 1999. Em and his crew was going for a show in Honolulu, which everyone, including Em's bodyguard, had treated like a vacation. So they brought their wives and kids along. But as they boarded the flight, Em's bodyguard spotted some of them red shirts on the plane. And that's when everyone started to panic because they knew it was Shug's goons. By the time they landed, it was even worse. And as we're riding past the front part of the airport, you see a sea of Defro guys. They got on red and black Defro jerseys. 
Eminem didn't fold because unlike what Suge would have had you believe, the rapper was a tough street guy that had been through the bender and lived what he rapped. And he had many other loyal tough street dudes that kept him safe. If Suge was going to hang him from a building, he was going to have to get close. And he tried. He tried to get close. Actually, it's funny because he showed up to the he came, it was like, shoes outside, shoes outside. Everybody like, shoot, shoot, shoot. He was running, dropping, shoot. Like, man, everybody going, out. I'm in front of the camera like this. This was the very next year, 2002. Eminem had signed 50 Cent to his Shady Records, and he too had become something of pure, insane success. Now, they was at the video shoot of In The Club when Suge decided to show up, and he came around with 30 Mexican gangbangers. 18th Street, if you know what I mean, don't believe me? Hear someone else tell the story. We were shooting In The Club video, and uh, somebody said, Suge, not here. And uh, 50 was, I was at the bar, gang was there. He was shooting In The Club scene. And he stopped, and Suge came in with 30 Mexicans, like mm -hmm. he said, there you go. which is weird, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but 50 Cent stood his own. His crew stood their own. They didn't want no problem. But if there was going to be a problem, no problem. So picture it, Suge, a black man with about 30 Latinos on one side, and 50 Cent on the other side with his crew of black men. And don't forget, one white boy. He liked a cigar, and he was trying to see what you going to do. So Eminem, 50, everybody outside. Like the cigar? I was bugging because I seen this one. I knew Eminem was real. He's like, I don't give a f man. <laughs> I swear, this one I knew. I'm like, damn, Eminem is a real. <laughs> <and he thinks> <laughs> <he's>... <laughs> 